Bishop Key Sloan, who is the former bishop of Alabama, as well as the bishop who ordained me, is well known in my former diocese of Alabama as a great storyteller. So Bishop Sloan decided to take some of the stories of his life and fictionalize them turn them into a series of novels. The first one which came out when I happened to be finishing up my time in seminary. And many of the stories that are featured in Bishop Sloan's books are stories that those of us who have heard him preach many times have heard him say before. Although there's others as well that using his expertise as a storyteller, he dramatizes in a way that makes him very active and engaging. One of these stories comes from Bishop Sloan's second book, Beulah. You know, all of these stories follow Buddy, a young priest who, uh, gone through many of the same things that Bishop Sloan did in his own life. And at this point in the series, in Yule, Buddy is serving at a church in rural Mississippi, in fact, where uh, Bishop Sloan himself came from. And while Buddy is there, while he's serving as a priest at the church uh, in this small town, he befriends a young man Jojo. And Jojo gets his start at the church by helping do the yard work there. Now, one day, Buddy decides to take Jojo out to lunch. To understand what happens next, it's important to know that Buddy is a white pastor and Jojo is a young black man. And while this is set many years after segregation, not everybody in Buddy's church is happy about who he's associated with. And so very soon after this lunch, Chuck, who happens to be one of the church leaders, confronts Buddy about what he's done. But he points out that the money he spent for this lunch is his own. It's not the churches, it's not the discretionary money. This is his own money. And Chuck responds to that by saying, it's money we pay you. <clears throat> now this conversation is understandably hard on Buddy. But he still moves forward, listening in his heart for what he thinks God is telling him to do. He still strives, even after this, to do everything he can to serve God in the best way possible and to reach out with kindness to all in the community that he needs. Paul in 2 Corinthians this morning tells us, we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. Now these are words for all of us to keep in mind. And that's whether we serve the church in the pulpit or in the pews. We need to ask ourselves, thinking about this verse, who are we listening to? Are we listening to the views that are inside ourselves? Or instead, are we taking the time to listen to what it is that God has to say to us?
And like Buddy, Jesus also goes head-to-head with the religious leaders of his day. Now, Jesus's issues are different than Buddy. They don't have to do with race. What we hear in our gospel today is the issue that Jesus is dealing with has to do with the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath as laid out in Deuteronomy is about giving a time of rest, a time of rest for everybody. And this truly is everybody. As Deuteronomy lays it out, the Sabbath rest is given to immigrants and to the land. It's given to the, the livestock that the Israelites are keeping. It's even given to the slaves that the Israelites have. So the Sabbath day is the one day where everyone gets a chance to rest. It's the one day that no one can be exploited. And it's something worthwhile for us to think about in our day and age, to think about what it means for everyone in the world, everyone, to have the opportunity to rest. So the Sabbath is about giving people rest. It's about providing a break. It's something intended for the well-being of everyone. And so Jesus' disciples, as we see them, they're on the Sabbath, and they're hungry. They pick some of the grain that's there. Now, this is something that they could do. This was a lawful act. The only issue is that they're doing it on Sabbath. And in Jesus' day and age, which has continued until now, there were many debates about the Sabbath. In particular, what constitutes work? And some of these debates were very unhelpful. And this is what Jesus and his disciples are running into with the religious leaders of their time. Jesus points out to them what's really going on here. He's pointing out that the Sabbath is meant to help people. And that's the spirit behind what's going on with this day of rest. And Jesus goes further. In the synagogue, even, he goes in and heals a man. He asked those around him, can you do good or harm on the Sabbath? No one responds. That's something that makes Jesus very angry. It's something that makes him grieve. That there is no answer that these people have for this question. Knowing that the Sabbath is about help, knowing that it is about doing good for others, Jesus does heal this person. And as Buddy dealt with issues from his congregation because of the good that he was doing in the community, because of what he did with Jojo, Jesus too faces difficulties from the religious leaders in his own day and age. In fact, what we see at the end of our gospel today is that what Jesus has done is laid the groundwork for all these different religious leaders to come together and to do whatever they can to hurt Jesus. This is the path that leads Jesus down to his own.
destruction to the cross by these religious leaders. Now with Jesus, we see the negative of what can happen. When we look to our own ways instead of those of God. Thankfully, in 1 Samuel, we see a very different story, with a very different ending. There we see Samuel, who is one of the great prophets in ancient Israel. This is the prophet who would anoint the first two kings of Israel, even. First Saul and then David. At this point, though, we see Samuel as a youth. Samuel, who is a prayed for baby. His mother, Hannah, prayed to God that she would have him and swore that if she did, that she would give Samuel. To a life in the temple, to a life serving the Lord. And so she gives him over to Eli, who is the head priest at this point in time. As we see in our reading, Samuel at this young age is being called for the very first time by God, called to serve in this role as a prophet. It's important to realize, too, here that Eli, who's been serving as his father, is not just a head priest. He's also a judge, the judges being the ancient rulers of Israel before the kings. So this is a very important person that we're talking about. Eli, too, also had his own biological sons before he started raising Samuel. And unfortunately, he did a very poor job in raising them. Eli's children were doing very terrible things. And God has had enough. So the word he gives to Samuel is to tell him, to tell Eli, that his time is over. So as Eli is called, Samuel now is being raised up. And as we hear, he would become such a great servant of God that none of his words would fall to the ground. Now after Samuel has heard these words from God, Eli presses President to tell him what it is that God had to say. Samuel is now put in the awkward position of having to tell Eli what God said, that his time is over because of what his sons have done. Now, Eli could have been like the religious leaders in Jesus' day. He could have been like Chuck with Buddy. He could have said, this is wrong what you were telling me. I'm going to cast you out. But he doesn't. Eli accepts what God has said. He accepts the word of the Lord, even though it means not so great things. Who are we proclaiming? As Paul says to the Corinthians, this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we doing what Paul says, proclaiming Jesus as our Lord, or are we proclaiming ourselves? Are we following the rules because it's what God wants for us to do? Or are we following rules because we think that they are our rules and being our rules, that they must be followed.
Walking the path that Jesus has laid out for us is never easy. Jesus' own road led to the cross. And we see that road start to be paved in our reading from the Gospel according to Mark this morning. And yet, following God is the only hope we have for making it through. Following God is the only way to make our weakness into strength. That's what Paul means by talking about the clay jars, the treasure in these weak clay jars that are able to break so easily. We see this too in God coming down into this world in the form of Jesus, a weak, frail human child. That's where we see God's power transforming weakness into strength. As Paul lays out for us in 2 Corinthians as well, following Jesus isn't easy because it leads to being afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. But as Paul tells us too, if we're listening to God throughout the way, if we're doing everything we can to follow our Lord, then all those things will be transformed so that we will not be crushed. We will not be driven to despair. We will not feel forsaken, be forsaken. We will not be destroyed even as we go through all these hardships that life in following our Lord makes us face. Being a prophet and spreading the word of God can be a very difficult thing. And yet in the end, no matter where that leads, we have the righteousness of God on our side. We have goodness and truth that only come from the Lord. That's all at the end of the day that there really is. It's all that we as human beings really need.